This is a presentation that I've given at the MRC on July the 17th, 2013. The background to this is that this is a meeting to discuss antibiotic resistance and how the MRC can contribute to replenishing the antibiotic pipeline. So for background purposes, it's important to remember that antibiotic use benefits the individual and society. Of course, many of the infections that people suffer from in 2013 are those that were experienced in the pre-antibiotic era, and these are shown here in pink. Medicine has improved incredibly in the last 50 years, and we're now able to carry out procedures that were not even imaginable. And these are shown here in green, and as you can see, many of these are associated with increasing age and are absolutely underpinned by the use of antibiotics. So for all of these areas at all stages of life, antibiotics are essential. And without antibiotics, much of modern healthcare would fail. However, unlike most other therapeutic drugs, antibiotics are used widely outside of human medicine. They're used in animals, horticulture, agriculture, bees, brewing, to name a few. In fact, there is ubiquitous use of these drugs and therefore they are undervalued both by society but in terms of cost as well. With all this antibiotic use has come the very rapid selection of antibiotic resistant bacteria. This timeline shows at the top here when most antibiotics were first used in human medicine and the timeline below shows the first report of antibiotic resistance to those drugs and you can see that there is a very close association. But what are the main concerns for human medicine? Well, in June 2013, it was documented that these are the main concerns, particularly within the United Kingdom, but elsewhere. And until recently, we very much kept hospital uh, infections separate to those from community predominantly because they were caused by different bacteria and so the resistance issues were quite different. However, the boundaries between these are becoming increasingly blurred with patients from community taking infections into hospital and those from hospital taking them out into community. But what about correlations between resistance and outcome? There's a good correlation between very serious infections such as those in the bloodstream or patients in the intensive care unit and poor outcome when the patients are infected by antibiotic resistant bacteria. Currently, data suggests there's a less good correlation for non-bacteremic infections or those caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, but this may simply be because there's a lack of data rather than a lack of correlation. Nonetheless, as you can see here, antibiotic resistance has a major impact on the outcome of treatment. So how much resistance is there? And this is just one screenshot from the ECDC site, which uh, annually reports prevalence of resistance from uh, contributing laboratories. And these are the most up-to-date data for 2011. And these are heat maps, and as they go from cold colours to hot colours, that indicates an increase in the percent of resistant bacteria. And these data are just for Klebsiella that have caused invasive infections. On the left-hand side, the percent resistant to third-generation Kephrosporins, and on the right, the percent that are have intermediate susceptibility to or are resistant to carbapenems. As you can see for Kephrosporins, there is widespread resistance and for some countries, including the United Kingdom, resistance is now endemic. For carbapenems, the picture is very much as it was for Kephrosporins a few years ago, where the southern European countries seem to have greatest prevalence of resistance. However, there have been sporadic outbreaks including within the UK and the most pessimistic outcome is that within a couple of years the heat map 
will be all red for Europe. One of the reasons that the prevalence of resistance is increasing and there's this uh, spread from country to country is of course bacteria move around between environments, they also share their antibiotic resistances, but we move around too and we take these bacteria with us, we often carry them in our gut, but we share our environment, we don't live in a sterile environment and whilst we talk about good infection control practices in hospital to prevent the spread of resistant bacteria, we don't take these forward into our other environments. There's widespread global travel and global move of food products. And for instance, uh, it's been shown that a quarter of Swedish residents returning from holiday outside their own country had extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing bacteria in their gut. And these are resistant to third generation capisporin. So what are the costs of resistance? Well, as most of you know, in January of every year, there's a World Economic Forum meeting in Davos in Switzerland. And prior to that, there's a global risks register published. And for the first time in January 2013, a chapter was published for antibiotic resistance. Several of us around the world contributed information for this chapter. And when it was presented on a map like this, most of us were surprised at the sheer scale of the problem. The data for Europe was based on available figures for 2007 and at that time it was estimated that 1.5 billion euros per year was the cost of antimicrobial resistant bacterial infections. Some of the other facts here were very surprising to me and I draw your attention to just one more, Tanzania the death rate of children infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria was estimated to be double that of malaria and I find that a very shocking statistic. What this map also shows is that antibiotic resistant bacteria are not only found throughout the world, they're having a huge impact throughout the world, both on mortality but also on morbidity, so the cost to society is very great. And this has led to a series of statements, but most recently, last September, when Margaret Chan stated that if health fails, all else fails. I would add to this that if health fails due to antibiotic resistance, all medicine will fail. So there are around 200 antibiotics. So why are more needed? What are the problems? Well, until the last decade, we were in a very uh, good situation where, it, in a way, it didn't matter if a bacterium was antibiotic resistant because there was usually another drug that could be taken off the shelf. It might be more expensive, it might have adverse reactions, but there was the possibility of several treatment options. Well, today that's just not the case. And for many of the bacteria on the list shown earlier, such as these very resistant Enterobacteriaceae or Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter, there aren't a lot of options. Secondly, with many drug companies not making antibiotics anymore, there, aren't, there isn't the pipeline that there once was. So even if the drugs available became less useful, there are always new ones being made to replace them. And in fact, this timeline here shows just how stark the fall off has been in the last 10 to 15 years of new drugs reaching the marketplace. In part, it's thought that this might reflect the exhaustion of the most easily commercialized agents. In other words, all the low-hanging fruit has been picked and it's now much more difficult to find new molecules. But there are many other reasons for why there are no new antibiotics. Many people have discussed the issue of the withdrawal of Big Pharma from this area, but in part this has also been due to the fact that many of the pharmaceutical agencies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, have combined and merged. So whereas there may have been 20 to 25 companies about 15 to 20 years ago, there are really only about six now. And of those, many of them have withdrawn from this area of research and development in particular because of the perceived lack of return on investment 
this really is because there's been a move towards treatments for chronic conditions rather than acute. With this background, there has been a lack of funding for discovery and research, both within the industry, but also within academia. It was always perceived by funding agencies that this is an area of research for industry and not for them to fund. And so there has been a depletion of skills and researchers across the piece. And there have been issues with licensing and regulating new antibiotics where it's considered that the model is not fit for antibiotics and there have been many issues, not least being unable to quickly and accurately diagnose the cause of infection when you're entering patients in trials and of course this has meant that the trials have ended up having many, many more patients than necessary. So the global action that's needed has been to identify ways to start encouraging companies to make these drugs again. And there have been a lot of discussions about a new business model and types of business model, and I'm sure we'll come back to these today. My view, and I've been very public about this, is that we need to view antibiotic resistance as a global crisis akin to the way AIDS was perceived in the 1980s. And Again, my personal view is it needs a global push with national uh, agencies contributing so that all of the parts come to uh, solutions. There have been great efforts in the last year to overcome the challenges. The EU Innovative Medicines Initiative has been able to configure itself and there have been two calls so far. Uh, which have uh, funded partnerships and the ninth call is due to be uh, announced. These have funded members of the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries to link with academic consortiums to um, establish a clinical trials consortium to test new drugs and to start looking at how to overcome barriers of getting drugs into gram-negative bacteria. BARDA in the United States have funded at over 200 million now to uh, combat bioterrorism and antibiotic resistance. And the GAIN Act in the United States has alleviated some of the uh, process, uh, particularly uh, with speedy application reviews, and some companies have been able to put products through this process already. And then both the European Medicines Agency and the FDA have been reviewing their guidelines for evaluating new antibiotics and have been very, working very closely with companies to improve this situation too. But are these enough? Well, if we look at the attrition rate for any therapeutic area of drug development and the fact that it's been widely stated that we need a minimum of five, if not 20, new antibacterial drugs to cope with the issues of today, let alone those that will meet us going forward, then a minimum of 200 discovery, research and development programs are required. And that's the most optimistic view. So hundreds of programs are required and this really needs everybody to be involved. And then industry needs to be encouraged to pick up and license any new molecules if they're discovered in academia or small medium enterprises. So with this background, Antibiotic Action, which is a global public awareness initiative to educate everybody about all of the issues on antibiotic resistance and lack of new treatments, held a meeting a few weeks ago in London, um, co-supported by the BBSRC, the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, to see what can be learnt from pharma about drug discovery and development of new drugs and to learn from their successes and their failures to inform us going forward and, and into a new area, a new era of drug discovery, research and development. So what were the key messages? Well, the key messages were that unlike 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, academia has a pivotal role to play in the process of discovery, research and development of new antibacterials. 
academic researchers can learn from industry researchers and indeed should increase collaboration between academia and industry. And I'll come back to how this could uh, be facilitated in a minute. If we look here at the drug discovery pipeline up to phase one clinical development, what were the key messages about these areas? Well, firstly, target identification is really important that targets are not present in humans. They're essential to the bacterium's survival. And moreover, molecules can be found to inhibit them. The industry mantra of fail early, fail, fail cheap is very important. So targets have to be validated and academic researchers need to be encouraged to drop targets should they really not look as if they're going to be uh, yield a, a useful drug for treating patients. And this was highlighted at the meeting as being something that academic researchers are not keen to do. They have their favourite enzyme or favourite type of system and they really want to research it to the nth degree. But in terms of drug discovery, if this is not going to be a suitable target, then that target should be dropped and move on. Bioinformatics and genomics. Well, this certainly has made new targets easy to identify both in industry and in academia. And lots of targets have been described over the last decade. Unfortunately, this has not yielded any new antibiotics. And one of the reasons for this is the whole cell context has often been overlooked in these uh, systems. So a chemical may be a good inhibitor and you may have a, what looks on paper to be a very good target. But the chemical will be is poor at entering the bacterial cell and even worse, it's transported out of it. And this is a particular and significant challenge for new drugs for gram-negative bacteria. Natural products, there was a considerable amount of discussion about natural products. Um, many of the antibiotics used successfully to treat patients are derived from natural products. And it's considered that this still remains a large untapped source of new leads, lots of uh, ideas of where these can come from, lots of data showing interesting molecules. Natural product chemistry really moved out of vogue in industry, although it has kept going in academia. And this is really the, big, the clear area where it was thought that the low-hanging fruit had been completely picked and it became much more challenging. Um, in the last decade, there have been new coach techniques, and metagenomic based approaches could now provide fruitful avenues to explore. And genomics has also revealed cryptic biochemical pathways that could produce new metabolites with antibiotic potential. And there's quite a lot of work going on in this area too. So natural products, before all that expertise completely disappears from industry researchers, need to be captured and it would be a very fruitful area to explore. So what else came out of the meeting? Well, it's considered that academic researchers have very important roles in understanding bacterial physiology and particularly those aspects relevant to antibacterial discovery. So understanding the biology of the bacterial cell world, really getting to grips with the entry and efflux systems of gram-negative bacteria and thoroughly understanding antibiotic resistance. Um, other strategies to overcome resistance, there's been discussion about why are combinations not widely used in, uh, to treat bacterial infections, unlike other areas of medicine, so they are widely used for TB. There are often uh, several drugs used to treat patients with serious infections, but it's very rare that combinations are taken as the norm. And various suggestions uh, for how combinations could proceed and certainly the first two are already being actively explored, uh, but in terms of discovery, uh, could be looking at uh, new molecules in combination with licensed antibiotics. Uh, one of the challenges is that making combinations of two new molecules is thought to be uh, extremely difficult because there's so many aspects to, to um, resolve, including getting two molecules that have the same pharmacokinetic properties. 
Altered dosing has certainly been uh, able to resolve difficulties in early stage development, such that drugs that were thought to be uh, uh, unlikely to be uh, useful um, have become uh, into, into viable options. And then another big issue is, you know, how do we know when resistance is going to emerge? So resistance studies in the lab to select chromosomal mediated resistance is one thing, but really challenging and finding new resistances could be another area where genomics could come in and screening environmental bacteria for resistance to new molecules might reveal uh, resistance problems around the corner. And finally, of relevance today, it was felt at the Wellcome Trust meeting, and I've heard it elsewhere, a prioritised list of key questions would be valuable. And some of the things that I've just mentioned clearly are questions to go on that list. One of the issues with the funding that has become available and indeed has been awarded in the last year is that it's not always been competitive and in furthermore it's not been open to all. So it, one of the recommendations from the meeting was that awards must be based on quality, in other words due diligence must be carried out as judged by experts antibacterial discovery research and development. So if the MRC is going to go forward to this, one of the recommendations is that you may wish to consider an expert panel outside of the current board structure. There clearly is a role for national funding agencies and we hope the MRC will be able to contribute more to this area. And we ended up at the meeting in May discussing the role of centres co-located in a single geographical place or virtual networks or consortia and we truly believe that the United Kingdom offers much more than the standard large pharmaceutical company in the expertise that we have across the piece from academia to small medium enterprise and that we could really make some significant contributions to this area. Thank you.